and Quentin Baxter. Okay. Also yeah. signing on. Sorry about that construction going on. And Mr. Chairman, whenever you're ready to begin, I believe there's a quorum. Jennifer, what do we want to do a screen share of the agenda? Um, we can. Do you you want me to share the agenda or the um, the public art policies, purpose, and goals? I, I was going to I was going to start with the agenda. Okay, so sure. We can get underway. All right. And can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. yes. Okay, so Chairman Green, if you'd like to tackle points one and two, I think we can two. get underway. Oh, I yeah, I can't see the screen. <laughs> well, the first point is call to order, and the second okay. is the chairman's welcome. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome everyone back to city business. I hope everyone has had a pleasant time uh, with COVID and uh, let's get this meeting started. Wonderful. Well, it's been a good solid year as all of you are aware. Um, we were planning our, our last arts commission meeting for March of 2020 um, with a, a pretty robust agenda and expecting to be heading into Spoleto and Piccolo Spoleto in the balance of the year. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, so that the next two points, um, items three and four are listed as introduction of new commissioners and report on term cycles, reappointments and vacancies. Um, I'd like to take a minute to ask Shakur Francis uh, to introduce himself to the commission. He was appointed, I believe, in November um, with some other reappointments. And I've had the good fortune to work with Shakur um, previously by way of the mayor's office. And if you'd care to uh, yeah. give a brief introduction. And um, as we talk about anything else, commissioners, feel free to introduce yourselves as, as the conversation unfolds. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shakur Francis. Um, I am sorry for my dress. I was out doing yard work today and I almost forgot about this meeting, um, but I'm excited to be on the Arts Commission. Um, as Scott alluded to, I um, briefly worked with him. I was Mayor Tetlenburg's first intern um, when he was elected during the summer of 2016. Um, I was born and raised on the peninsula of Charleston, graduated from Burke High School, um, nine years ago, and I am currently serving as a United Methodist pastor. And so um, I'm just really excited uh, to serve my community. And um, when I noted that people like Jonathan Green um, were on this commission, I just thought this would be a great way to give back. And so thank you for allowing me to serve. And I'm looking forward to working with you all and um, serving our great city of Charleston. Thanks, God. Welcome. Wonderful. And I'd also like to recognize that um, even as she's been serving on this committee uh, due to COVID, Councilwoman Del Chapa is joining us for the first time. So um, we've been fortunate to, to be working together you know, in these virtual ways and on, on different committees, but it's, it's nice to have 
heard here represent council, uh, council member Gregory is not with us today. Um, and we do have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, the board's plus system uh, seems to have alluded having some reappointments be flagged with the mayor's office, but we'll work with Brittany on that. But I believe that at present, um, Chairman Green's term is current, Louise Corrigan, Robin Gibson, Shakur are all current. Um, we then have reappointments for those who were on that I think simply lapsed in February and didn't get flagged as, as needing a, a board a council memo for Steve Simon, who's with us today, Kristen Alexander, who's with us today, Quentin Baxter, who's with us today, and Kara Leapson, who may be calling in shortly. Um, that leaves Steve Rosenberg um, absent today, and we'll follow up with him more about his continued service. But I will flag that um, we have two tenures that concluded in February that are not being renewed. Um, Dr. Karen Chandler at the College of Charleston is in the process of retiring um, from her post there and moving to Nashville. She's actually spending most of her time in Nashville already. And so we graciously thank Karen for her uh, service, not only on this committee, but also on the Arts and History Commission previously. And Mark Sloan from the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art at the College of Charleston uh, retired in December. He um, has been actually working remotely from North Carolina uh, for the better part of this whole year. Um, and Mark was so instrumental in, in helping us with advancing a discussion about public art policy and how that programming can be advanced. Um, so we thank Mark for his service. And essentially that leaves us with two vacancies, which um, I know we have candidates for the mayor to review and recommend to city council, but we feel that um, we'll get all of the, the paperwork in order, but we thank you for your patience during the disruption. And um, if anybody has any questions about the term of service or, or when their uh, appointment cycles, please feel reach out to Basil at the Office of Cultural Affairs. Um, so that brings us to the next agenda item and Chairman Green, I will read it for you, which is review of public art guiding principles. Um, and next step for public art programs. So you will recall that last March, we had intended to bring forward from our legal department, um, a proposed ordinance or, or uh, policy to be adopted by resolution at city council based on the work that was presented to the arts commission in the summer of 2019. Uh, PowerPoint that was put together by the Moorhead scholars visiting from the University of North Carolina and working in close coordination with Mark Sloan, Catherine Zomer Davis of Enough Pie, the Office of Cultural Affairs, and a, a standing working group um, tasked with, with public art. Um, in the interim, because the Special Commission on Equity, Inclusion, and Racial Conciliation is looking at some areas about not just public art, but the broader demarcation of monuments, markers, public art, um, and public art policies, policies for the city of Charleston itself. We chose to not fully table bringing the ordinance forward but we don't want to bring forward one set of recommendations and then immediately need to amend them in four weeks time. So we're anticipating by, by May 15th, the recommendations for the special commission, um, which will include a governance proposal for a jurisdictional body that will weigh in. It may well be composed of members of the arts commission and the history commission um, that we talk not just about where the commas are on a statue's plaque, but also the appropriateness of what's being cited in the public realm. 
Um, so we'll have more to follow, but we did want to bring forward for review here. Um, and I, I will help our chairman by, by reading the document that's on your screen. We were hoping that the Arts Commission would at least endorse the guiding principles, purpose, and goals set forward and, and vetted by our legal staff. So this document that's on the screen now says the city seeks to establish and adopt the following public art policies, purpose, guiding principles of public art. One, to express Charleston's identities through the built environment. Two, to elevate the role of the artist in the creative process and connecting people in place. Three, to provide equitable access to a diverse range of artists and artistic experiences. Four, to provide equitable access to public art for all communities of Charleston. Five, to encourage multidisciplinary collaboration in the public and private sectors to create vibrant public spaces. Six, to celebrate the cultural assets of various communities in Charleston by highlighting their unique character of our neighborhoods, honoring their histories and preserving the quality of place. So that, that will read in the start of whatever ordinance is eventually brought forward as um, the purpose. The goal is set out more a sense of what we seek to accomplish and what the desired outcomes are. So specifically, the goals of the city's public art program are to one, foster quality design and the creation of an array of artwork in all media, materials, styles, and discipline that best respond to the distinctive characteristics of each project site in the community that it serves. Two, to reflect the diversity of culture, heritage, and expressions of Charleston and South Carolina. Three, to encourage art projects for open spaces, parks, infrastructures, and facilities that enhance the quality, pride, and civic identity of neighborhoods in the city. Four, to encourage the role of artwork in enhancing economic development and cultural tourism. Five, to encourage the role of artists in the functional design of eligible capital improvements. Six, to foster and encourage the development of future public artists. Seven, to encourage participation by citizens in the ideation and installation processes for public for artist projects. And eight, to document, preserve, restore, and or repair all public works of art. So I'll leave it open for any comment or discussion. Um, I suppose we could have a motion to endorse this document um, with the understanding that final review of, of its recommendations will be with a, a, a more developed uh, policy guide. So moved. Second. Does anyone have questions, comments, any discussion? Uh, uh, this is Chair Jonathan Green. My only question would be in terms of private spaces, areas in the city of Charleston. Uh, how does that affect uh, public art? So I, I think for the terms of this document, uh -huh. in, in terms of this document, it would certainly encompass a, a global purview that is anything that is you know, visible from the public right of way, you know, even if it's cited on a private piece of property. The, the, uh -huh. the real detail in that work is what will be forthcoming because I, I do think the special commission recommendations will look for a, a slightly more aggressive approach to jurisdiction. Okay. I have one so, comment. I think it's a very inspiring document. So would the chair like to call for a vote? I'd like to call for a vote. I thought it was already passed. I thought it was already accepted. <laughs> it, was, it was moved and seconded. Okay. 
Yes. So okay. And any dissent? Any objection? Uh, no, well, none. To to pick up on um, Steve Ms. Simon's comment, I've got who is that? Jennifer. It is, Mr. Chairman. We we need an actual vote to ask for all in favor. <laughs> yes, all in all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. So I will pick up on the um, enthusiasm that Steve Simon uh, demonstrated towards this with just a uh, brief discussion of some things that have been in the works and are proceeding um, in spite of the pandemic. So the first part of it is we are actively pursuing funding from a variety of sources, national and regional, um, to give us some working capital to, to build out more public art initiatives from July 1, it probably even starting earlier during Piccolo Spoleto, but by July 1 of this fiscal year, uh, moving into 2022 and 2023. So that includes pending requests with a Facebook funded grant program called Sustainable Black Communities um, mm. that's proposing work in underrepresented and underserved parts of our community as a device to foster dialogue and discussion about racial equity. It includes a pending letter of intent at South Arts, a regional funding body um, supported by the National Endowment for the Arts and State Arts Councils. And that is for their cross-sector uh, grant-making program under the title Arts and Equity. And this again would be a program that would launch probably with the Moja Arts Festival in the autumn and extend all the way through Piccolo Spoleto 2022, but using public art and public art installations as a place for convening and gathering um, and celebration. Um, specifically that the, the project is entitled Celebrating Black Lives. And part of this project would put agency in community partners to do the curation and programming rather than asking for the City of Charleston Office of Cultural Affairs or the Moja Arts Festival Planning Committee to dictate those things. Um, Kara Leibson, who's not on the call at present, um, is the Executive Director at Redux Contemporary Art Center and we have invited Redux to be our not-for-profit partner for the pursuit of the Bloomberg Asphalt Art Initiative, um, which is specifically tied towards elements of traffic and transportation infrastructure. So this is work that's proposed um, on the underside of I-26 in conjunction with the Friends of the Low Line and the work that Enough Pie um, has been doing with our traffic and transportation and parks departments. And that brings me to the things that are already happening. Yesterday up at Brigade Street, um, part of the unveiling of the safer mobility corridor for cyclists um, included public art elements that were developed um, in conjunction between Enough Pie and our traffic and transportation department and a city employee, Kelvin Bluffton, who is the artist brother and he's are. Um, so you may have seen on some of the junction boxes, there's one at QG and Meeting, one at South Windermere, um, the work of our ambassador for the arts and chair Jonathan Green, um, selected from the Gibbs collection. This is another similar wrap of what had been just a ugly utility box, um, now demarking you know, public art in the space. Um, we're also working with a grassroots collaborative called Tiger Strikes Asteroid. They had done an installation in Wagner Terrace uh, last summer or autumn um, called Yard Work, where all of the pieces were sited on private property, um, but were intentional temporary public art displays by local artists. And we're going to work with them during Pickle Exploto on the West Ashley Greenway to stimulate uh, community input about what a bigger public art project for the Greenway might look like. 
Um, it would be temporary. It would be kind of similar to tiny little library, free libraries where there is a armature, a box that holds an artistic installation and probably as many as 10 to 12 of them punctuating the greenway with the intention that then those boxes might be relocated to the bikeway in West Ashley or to the low line or to um, Daniel Island, wherever we can find the next appropriate place for them to be deployed with new artwork solicited at each round. And then we're also working with the Friends of the Low Country Low Line on a public art project um, that ties into their history project as well, which is the um, local watercolorist and educator, Andrea Hazel, um, has been the artist in residence at the Gibbs, but her work her practice right now is focused on taking old Department of Transportation photos of houses and businesses that were torn down to make way for the Crosstown and I-26 and artistically rendering those buildings as, as watercolors. So we're working on a proposal that will recreate those as oversized reproductions to be cited in the neighborhoods where that disruption happened as a, a mm. visual nod to the, the city of memory that hasn't existed for five decades. Um, mm. And also as a, a device to try to do some history harvest and, and storytelling so that we can capture the anecdotal and social histories that might be residing in a you know church fellowship hall or in somebody's attic or by way of a, a story told secondhand to a cousin that got related about, you know, why they really chose that house to tear down. Um, so we're really pleased that as we have been working quietly during the pandemic, um, we are able to move things forward. I'd also encourage you to look at Vivian Moultrie Playground and Park up at Mount Pleasant Street, where the first phase of the Enough Pie Awakenings project is complete, um, along with great new playground equipment by way of our parks department. Um, so we're, we're really hoping that in quick fashion, we can continue to, to put things into force rather than just hoping that down the road as budgets improve and sponsorships come back, we can have a robust public art program. We feel um, we can scale down to the available resources. The important part is, is to stay at. So I'd be happy uh, to answer any questions or um, take your, your, your feedback and comments. Okay. Uh, Scott, this is Jonathan. I, I, have, I have a comment, uh, excellent idea. Uh, is it possible that we can have a uh, sort of a takeaway from uh, Andrea Hazel's work in the form of note cards that could be sold or something so people can uh, share those images uh, beyond the city of Charleston, beyond the state of South Carolina. Is that possible? Is that a, is, is, could that be possible within the budget? I, I think that's a great idea, and, and, and we'll look into that. I'm, I'm sure um, the Gibbs would love to have something like that. You know, the mm -hmm. check out of the, the gift shop and, you know, little easy impulse buy. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a great comment. Okay, great. And then my other question is in terms of uh, historical monuments, I don't know if we, uh, you know, I don't know if we will be even addressing any of those, but are, are we going to eventually deal with the issues of people like Robert Smalls in terms of a monument to him? Yes, <laughs> definitely yes. Um, so that falls into some of the recommendations that will be coming forward from the special commission. Um, okay. And I, I will work, I'll give a, a brief report in a minute about what the city's cultural efforts have been during the pandemic. Um, we okay. feel we have a great opportunity specifically with Robert Smalls because of um, a, a depth of cultural assets that we have mm -hmm. walking tours, we have the state historic marker that you can call and have uh, Robert Smalls talk back to you. Um, mm -hmm. And we have most recently the exhibition that ran at City Gallery with Chairman Green's illustrations for the freedom ship of Robert Smalls 
uh, which now we'll be taking out to schools and library spaces as that becomes safe and possible. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually have a, a full proposal um, based on a, a model developed by Mural Arts Philadelphia and Monuments Lab, um, mm -hmm. where we have a, a community engagement piece about how they would like to make proposals, not, not a ideas competition, but just what are the important things for how we celebrate our history and memorialize um, not just individuals, but communities. Mm, sure. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a little bit broad, um, and I was hoping that Councilmember Gregory would, would be on the call because I, I have spoken with him prior to this meeting. Um, one, another key point of, of comment and recommendation that we're waiting to come from the Special Commission is about the artwork that is on display globally in city spaces, city owned facilities, but specifically City Hall and sort of a, a bifurcation of what is in the public corridors and what is in city council chambers. And so in discussion with council member Gregory and with the mayor, um, I can quickly outline not where a final decision has been made, but where the current thinking is leaning. And mm -hmm. we'd welcome any input from the commissioners. Um, but the, the first note is that the pieces that are current, and, and also identify that um, in the state newspaper today, uh, reporter Caitlin Bird wrote extensively about the artwork at City Hall in Charleston. Um, and both the opportunities it affords for education and the challenges in the fact that some of the historical figures depicted in, in the artwork um, may not be the reflective of the city's current values or, or um, be, be the uh, individuals that we would choose to highlight. Uh, um, but specifically, we feel that the recommendations that will come forward will be for a professional comprehensive audit involving both a curatorial perspective and an academic or historic perspective on the artwork that is on display in city council chambers. Um, this collection was extensively inventoried and appraised in conjunction with the rent renovations of city hall, but it was largely placed um, in consultation with the architect uh, rather than considering any message that certain pieces being cited in given places were. And I know that our clerk of council also has an interest in this. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to scope out an effort to fully assess you know, the collection, verify all of the terms of the quest and gifts, and then likely both rearrange how it's installed and incorporate new additions to what's on display in council chambers. Um, that's both to be more inclusive and, and reflective of Charleston's diversity, but it's also to try to anticipate um, the fact that, that many of, of the individuals who are highlighted and featured in this collection um, are there because they in some way were groundbreaking pioneering individuals who represent a first, whether that's George Washington as our first president or whether that's Septima Clark. Um, and again, giving some coherence and narrative rather than just hanging the big pictures where the big pictures fit and the light sensitive ones in the places where they won't have direct sunlight, um, I think it'll be a good effort. The more immediate piece that we proposed, and we, we were open to your comments. At present, the third floor of City Hall, which is infrequently visited by 
either the general public, uh, likely even by council members, is sort of a, a grandmother's attic of old mayors' portraits, a few pieces of sculpture, and a portrait of Andrew Jackson and a portrait of Robert E. Lee that were moved out of office locations in, in City Hall. On the second floor, there are three mayors um, who previously, prior to the renovation, their portraits had been in council chambers, but they were put out into the second floor hallway. So in speaking with um, the mayor, with council member Gregory and with Angela Mack at the Gibbs, we are proposing to move um, the three mayors currently on the second floor to join their fellow civil servants on the third floor. Um, that'd be Mayor Wagner, Mayor Courtney, and I believe Mayor Smythe, which will leave us room right by the doors into council chambers and as people come to visit the mayor's office to show more contemporary Charleston artist work. And the pieces are, are still being identified, but we, we feel we can probably put three pieces on, on loan um, in that location that will be secure. And again, by, by making measured choices, we'll be showing the work of 21st century and 20th century Charleston artists rather than just portraiture of 19th century leaders. Um, the other piece that has been discussed is we're exploring what's possible for art display on the ground floor where currently there's a, a nook that's used for a video display telling you the story of renovating Charleston City Hall. There are also several panels with historical and archeological information about, you know, would you expect to find Delft China shards at 80 Broad Street or not? And we feel that we can reconsider what's on display there and in all likelihood have a changing exhibition program in that space, which won't necessarily be a fine art, you know, with museum quality, uh, humidity and temperature controls experience, but um, a private citizen who, who is also our ambassador for the arts made the excellent recommendation to me that perhaps the exhibition opportunity there would point people out to find more art experiences in downtown Charleston. So if you're here as a tourist and you come in and you see something like Andrea Hazel's watercolors um, or rap reproductions in a short video loop about her work, and it says to learn more, go to this gallery or go to the Gibbs Museum of Art, we'll be encouraging people to, you know, find their path year round. And by making it a, a changing exhibition program, we'll be able to feature, you know, a much broader number of artists than have historically been exhibited at City Hall. Yeah. So I will end my comments there, but would love any observations or feedback. Uh, this is Jonathan again. And uh, I, I like the ideas. It all sounds very good. What I would tend to think is that the area I think is on the second floor where you're talking about incorporating uh, uh, artist work, uh, not necessarily portrait, but just a contemporary artist. I think what's missing in what, what would help to enhance that space more rather than just artwork by artists in Charleston, I think it's more portraiture, but more portraiture of people that no one knows anything about. There's not a portrait of Alice Ravenel, Hugh G. Smith anywhere. There's not a portrait in City Hall, I don't think, of Robert Smalls. I don't think there's a portrait. I mean, you know, so those are the people to add to the portrait. That, I, I, I don't think it's really necessary to take down a portrait of anyone that someone has issues about in terms of their behavior in the past. I think what's important is to add to the collection of people that were active doing uh, perhaps the opposite of what those other portraits people were doing. I think that would be much more um, visually, uh, educationally interesting. Agreed. Great point. 
And again, the work that's being discussed is going in quickly would be on loan. So this could be an iterative process, you know, at, at some level, um, it might be that the more appropriate opportunity for a portrait of Robert Smalls is in council chambers. Um, so yeah. we, we, we want to structure our engagement in such a way that the, the goal that you're outlining, um, Chairman Green, I, I think is, is the aspiration we all share but we, we don't want to wait nine to 18 months for reports and condition reports and negotiating loans um, or mm. commissions. We, we want to make some changes mm. now so that when we come back to meeting in person at City Hall, mm. it is different than it was previously. Right. Well, you could certainly, you could certainly have a copy uh, uh, of a portrait of any of those people. I mean, that, you know, I mean, just to put something up there now and maybe address it later in terms of it being an actual piece of art painted by an artist. But I think coming in, going, coming out of COVID, getting back into the public, I think that's what people really want to see. Please. You're, please, you're muted. You're on mute. Am I on mute? No, no. Sorry, it wouldn't unmute with the bar. Um, I think these are great ideas, but I, for one, would say using reproductions when, and mm. that coming as a suggestion from artists and an arts commission, I would find that disturbing. I, I think from the, the city's perspective, we would only use reproductions in environments, possibly like that ground floor where there's humidity, where an original work would potentially be damaged. But I, I again, we, we, we will look at this opportunity and take it back to the mayor, um, as well as the special commission, um, because we, we, we want to move quickly and recognize that, you know, some loans might make sense for a shorter duration. Um, and I, I think what Chairman Green is proposing of celebrating lesser known protagonists of history, um, that's a project that will require a great deal of curation and research. And I would hope actually commissions that I think there's a, an enormous opportunity for contemporary local artists to have a, a chance to, you know, capture for, for posterity and, and our historical narrative, the, these under known figures of, of our shared stories. Absolutely. Okay, so I don't think any action is needed on, on this again, that um, until we have a direction from ultimately council, um, about what body will be charged with designating the, the most suitable and correct collection and how it should be displayed at City Hall. Um, we're largely working in areas where, where the, the existing relationships, um, the Gibbs working with the clerk of council to, to essentially manage a conservatorship and registrar of the city's collection um, but nothing right now where we're we are yet to actively go out and instigate creating new work or, or bringing new work into the gallery into into city hall um, and i will work to get out to you all a copy of the state newspapers article from today the file that was shared with me was 11 megabytes and i, I don't want to crowd your inboxes, but, um, but don't feel that you need to sign up for a subscription to, to get behind the paywall. Um, so that brings us to new business and the new business I will have to share is essentially our um, update on the year that's been. Um, but I, I will leave it to, to the chairman 
and the commissioners, if there's any other new business to come forward, I think this would be a good chance and I can kind of close out with a, a final report on 2020 in the first quarter of 2021. I would just like to share that the seventh annual Charleston Jazz Festival uh, will be held in April of 2022. Thank you, Steve. Anyone else? Okay, so um, by ordinance, you know, we are asking the Mayor's Commission on the Arts to receive an annual update on the activities funded directly by the city of Charleston to stimulate the arts and culture uh, here in our community. So that includes both things that my office is not direct, our re-granting of state accommodations tax, our support for key partners like the Gibson Museum of Art and the Gilliard Management Corporation, um, the International African American Museum. And I'm happy to give a very top line report there that um, specifically for accommodations tax, which is Steve or Quentin could report. Um, it's one of the few ways that a check comes from the city of Charleston to a local not-for-profit arts organization. Um, we were able, despite the pandemic, to fund standing commitments in 2020 at 50%, um, which took an awful lot of work by our accountants to, to pull off. Um, it also shows that even during the pandemic, tourists continued to come to Charleston and stay in hotels. Um, we had been fearing that, that, you know, at best we'd be able to fund 25% or possibly maybe even need to ask for people to return some portion of grants that were already dispersed. But for last year, um, we were able to honor a significant portion of the funds. And many organizations did have activity in the first quarter, so they had legitimate expenses. Um, I can also report that Together SC, um, the organization of not-for-profits around South Carolina, is just concluding and is about to announce a report on the, the health and institutional well-being of not-for-profits in the wake of COVID. And additional funding was leveraged so that uh, Kale Strategic Insights could do a specific assessment of the not-for-profit arts and culture sector. And while it's daunting, you know, we, we see national surveys that show 68% of the creative workforce is underemployed or out of work due to COVID. Um, we saw th this reporting will show 16% job loss statewide in the arts and culture not-for-profit sector. And that's largely been attributable to relief through the CARES Act, the Small Business Administration's PPP program. And while we're working through right now what's in the current stimulus bill, um, there's no question that the federal funds that came in are what have kept organizations from needing to, to fold. Um, I, I do think we'll see a few groups that choose to either realign or, or change how they operate coming out of the pandemic, but we did not see you know, a wholesale loss of um, activity in, in the sector. Um, so before I go on to the initiatives of the Office of Cultural Affairs, does anybody have any questions or, or comments on the city's overall engagement with the arts and culture sector? Um, so we've had a, a very interesting year at the Office of Cultural Affairs. Um, again, 
we expected that last year we'd be uh, getting ready for Piccolo Spoleto and putting a program guide to print and a website built. And instead we scrambled and moved heaven and earth to not put on the show. Um, and the positive is we actually were able to absorb all of the upfront administrative overheads and um, costs associated with the festival without needing to draw even the state accommodations tax funding for the festival. That we use uh, private donation and sponsorships that were fungible to other initiatives um, to proceed in May and June with some virtual programs and then to do something like in August of 2020, we invited the artists that traditionally exhibit at Marion Square to do a pop-up show at City Gallery at Waterfront Park. And again, it, I can tell you firsthand, it, it's just as hard to unplan something as it is to plan it. Um, but we're very proud of, of the work that city staff did across the board to not incur a loss in what essentially was a cancellation. Um, and similarly for the Moja Arts Festival, where we had a little bit more lead time, we worked with the city's um, COVID management team and just agreed that a festival that large largely draws an audience for public large scale events, thousands of people for a reggae concert or for a jazz finale um, that we would shift and we wouldn't encourage, um, you know, groups from African-American congregations to try to come see a theater show if we felt that they were gonna be in harm's way. So instead of the normal 11 day festival, we did 31 days of virtual programming, um, which included the things like Ranky Tanky's performance from a few years back at the Dock Street, which hadn't been shared, uh, being available free to watch on your computer. Um, with watch parties, we had Gina Castillo's Cha Cha Charleston song um, stitched into the US Conference of Mayors city song project and did a special showing of that. Um, but we also tried to support some things for artists in 2020. Um, so we were able to partner with the Charleston Music Hall and capture what would be equivalent to a Moja finale. Um, their Motown legacy show that was being done at the Bend with Kiana Parler and Charlton Singleton. And we turned around two weeks later a professional uh, video package with that with a sound mix. And again, made that available out to the public at large, free of charge um, in large measure due to Dominion Energy being willing to um, shift the purpose of, of their sponsorship. And then the part that I, I think I was most pleased about, um, we knew that for City Gallery, we could only get about 40 to 50 people through on a daily basis, given our COVID protocols. And so rather than giving an artist a chance to exhibit their work for a very limited audience, uh, we called upon Chairman Green to seek permission to reproduce on large format boards his artwork for Louise Merriweather's children's book, The Freedomship of Robert Smalls. And we installed a, a sequence by which you essentially encountered the story of the book through Jonathan's artwork and then were left staring out over Charleston Harbor where the planter had run, then run to freedom. Um, and we kept that exhibition in order to get as many people through as we could on view through February of 2021 with over 1,000 visitors um, we did extensive surveys. Most people said this was the first thing they had come to during COVID and they were incredibly appreciative of the safety protocols that we had put in place and the consideration for their health. Um, but we just view it as, as a great chance to, um, again, tell Charleston stories through the arts and, and celebrate. Um, this was a, a project that we pegged as part of the Charleston 350th 
commemoration as well. Um, and now the, the real fun begins because we have these professional boards and easels and storage bags. And so we can reuse this exhibition and take it to public schools, to libraries, um, any place that it would be good to tell the story. And, and I know Jonathan would like to see it, you know, find its way down to Beaufort and fill in all the low country in between. Um, so we're, we're just very pleased that in spite of the pandemic, we were able to, to keep things moving and, and still offer services. Um, 1,000 Charleston County School District students will receive a copy of the Freedom Ship of Robert Smalls um, by way of the Moja fourth grade readout program. And we'll renew that effort this fall as part of Moja 2021. Um, and then the last initiative I wanted to highlight was um, the Free Verse Poetry Festival. So this is, I believe the fourth year that we were planning Free Verse. And it's very hard when you're you know, visiting poets says they're not willing to travel. Um, we're, we're, used, we're mostly used to getting those riders or, or requests that it's about um, needing a vegan meal backstage. And instead this was, we needed to be virtual. Um, but we did run a week long series of programs with Marcus Amaker's leadership and curation. And it did involve uh, Beth Ann Fenway, the poet laureate of Mississippi traveling to the music hall where she was joined by Marcus. So uh, an intimate audience of two or talent of two um, in an empty concert hall, but we live streamed it out and reached thousands with it. Um, and he then closed out at his program um, again, using social media platforms like Instagram live um, with you know a leading national poet that again reached several thousand people. So we're just very appreciative of the resiliency of the artists that we work with locally, who have found ways to, to do things a little bit different, um, but not just simply say, you know, we'll be back in a couple of years. That, that we know that particularly for the performing arts, um, that audience encounter is critical. And you know, we're, we feel like we've learned a lot over this past year and hope that some of these new modes may continue to drive us forward. Um, we think there's greater accessibility, there's certain greater awareness. Um, when you see these virtual programs that have people around the world accessing them. And yeah, so while in many ways, this, was a, this past year was a year like no other before, um, we're, incredibly proud of the leadership and tenacity that the artist community in Charleston demonstrated. So with that, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions or return the floor to our chair for any final items. Uh, Scott, this is Jonathan. And I, I would like to say that those uh, virtual programs work extremely well. I had, uh, it was so positive for people to learn more about Charleston, to actually see the people in Charleston, people in Charleston can see people abroad. I think that's something that the city, certainly under the uh, proviso of the um, arts community, arts commission should continue to do. And Jonathan, I don't think you can see Kristen Alexander has her hand up. Yeah, I just um, okay. I just wanted to say, I'm, I really hear, appreciate hearing you um, recount everything. And I did want to say thank you to your office because it was exciting to be able to continue to be engaged within our community um, throughout, the, throughout the pandemic. So thank you for that. And I was hoping I could, oh, I'm sorry. Can I, I just, I didn't make my announcement and I should have. So if I can just sneak it in real quick. Um, the College of Charleston School of the Arts is presenting a festival um, next weekend, April 10th and 11th at the Stono Preserve in Hollywood. Um, so there's been a lot of effort to have a live uh, performance for our students. And there's gonna be three main stage shows, a musical uh, showcase, the student choreographed dance concert and an opera. 
Um, it's an all day event, but we're also going to be live streaming it on Facebook live. And it's going to also be um, shared on demand through our um, department as well. So I know the students would appreciate the support, but I, it is again, a testament of pushing forward and getting the students are really excited to be able to be performing uh, for an audience. Great. And Robin, did you have your hand up? I did. I just had a quick question. You mentioned the Charleston County um, School District and the students receiving some of the books and so forth. And I wanted to find out if there's any type of oversight that's done to see if there are possibilities for shared resources or if that already happens now, or if there's an opportunity for the Arts Commission to inform any of the arts curriculum. And I ask only from a personal perspective of a friend of mine that received a contract with Charleston County School District and she's actually putting together or has put together some videos and some of it is um, has been done down in Mexico, but a lot of it has been done here around Charleston. And I just feel like I want to find out if there's a way that we're maximizing the resources. If we're looking for grants, but then separately um, resources are funded or contracts are handed out. Like if there's a way where there could be like a cross pollination or we can inform the curriculum so that it sort of promotes what we're trying to do with some of the artists and the artwork that we're trying to put on display. Well, I'd be happy to, to speak with you offline, Robin. I, I can say that the city tends to work as a device for amplifying what others are already doing at the county level. And it's a little bit complicated because CCSD serves more than the city of Charleston. Mm -hmm. And the city of Charleston is not entirely served by Charleston County School District, that we also have Berkeley County School. And some of these initiatives are funded on a tri-county basis out of the Arts Commission, where we're working with Berkeley, Dorchester, and Charleston County. Um, but I, I think it would be, and maybe we can dedicate some time at a future commission meeting to walk through who all of the players are that are working. Mm -hmm. Because actually, in, over the course of the past five years, we've seen so much new energy come forward between engaging creative minds, the education department at the Gilliard Center, educational programs coming out of groups like Charleston Jazz. Um, so there's a there's a lot more work being done in the schools and with school audiences by independent not-for-profits than previously when the model was largely just contracting teaching artists and bringing them in on school time to do things in the schools. Um, I, I think at this point though, we, we, we need to get to next school year and hope that the virtual classroom is, is a thing of the past for most of us um because every everything has been complicated mm -hmm. i just want to make sure we we don't leave anything on the table in terms of being able to share and overlap resources and opportunities for funding and efforts and putting heads together and if it can work for one bucket it might work for several others and so just just the cross-pollination aspect of it is what i'm curious about So my last comment will just be that on um, Monday, Spoleto Festival USA will announce what they are planning from May 28th through June 13th. Um, we will announce Piccolo Spoleto's plans at that time. I don't think anyone would be surprised to know that it will be a smaller festival season this year um, because of COVID. But I think that everyone has demonstrated the highest standards of professionalism and focusing on safety for audiences and artists alike. Um, and moving out of that announcement, um, one of the things I'm happiest about for what we do with Piccolo Spoleto is we've been given the task to be all the more creative and spontaneous in our programming, that moving out of venues and into public settings, um, being told to do things like keep it short and don't draw a crowd. Um, we're, we're needing to think in new ways. And so while it's, it's a little bit daunting, um, I think it's, it's gonna be an exciting you know, next three months ahead of us as we push out of here on April 1st. And with that, Chairman Green, I'll- 
I agree with you, Scott, and I move to adjourn this meeting. Second. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.